ahead and get started. All right. Thank you so much, Jeff. I will go ahead and get started on this. Um, so just to start off with where we are, if you're not familiar with the Duluth County Warning Area, um, Duluth is at the head of Lake Superior, um, and Duluth and Superior, it's they're commonly referred to as the Twin Ports. Um, we're right across uh, the St. Louis River from Superior uh, at the head of the lake. So all the locations that I'll talk about in this presentation are fair, fairly close. Um, I also just want to, for context later on, show where the population density is. Um, and as you might expect on a city on a Great Lake, um, a lot of the population is centered right along the lake and the water here. Um, so our WFO is up here at the airport, which is at a higher elevation, um, kind of away from the population center. Um, Superior, Wisconsin has most of its population, again, kind of close to the water, um, to the north of where this incident occurred, because um, that comes into play a little later. Um, and then also the Duluth Emergency Operations Center is here down in what we call West Duluth. So I'm gonna start this off with a timeline um, get, to give you an idea of what the weather was like this day. This was our weather story for the day. It was a very quiet weather day. Um, we had a cold front that came through, a little bit of breezy northwest winds, um, but otherwise fairly quiet weather day. So I'm gonna show this a few times of who was working in ops and what they were doing. And I'll also kind of relate it to the ops level um, that have kind of assigned after the fact, we were not adjusting the ops level in real time because we were dealing with a large incident. Um, but just to give you an idea of kind of subjectively where I think we would have fall, where we fall on that scale of one to four. So morning pre-explosion, um, our lead forecaster, uh, Linda was working on the short-term forecast. Um, our observation program leader, Steve was working the public service desk. Um, and myself, I was working the, as the long-term, uh, on the long-term desk. Um, and I was a general forecaster at the time. Um, we also had one of our intern forecasters was in working as an X shift. Also in the office, we had uh, the MIC, the WCM, the SU um, as well. So we had about seven METs in the office to help out with ops, um, but only three of us were really working operations that day. So, you know, very, it's pretty much a blue sky day, level four operations, very quiet with it. Then this happens. Uh, there's an explosion that occurs at the uh, Husky Energy Refinery in Superior, Wisconsin. So at about 10.06, uh, the initial explosion occurred at the Husky Energy Oil Refinery in Superior, Wisconsin. At about 10.20, we received our first notification at the office. Um, I actually received this on a um, news app. One of our local news, uh, one of our local TV stations has, a, has an app and they sent it through a push alert there before we saw it anywhere on social media. Um, by 10.30, we had made calls to the county dispatch um, that would have been Douglas County, Wisconsin is the appropriate county, um, and also called the emergency manager to offer weather information, and they accepted our offer to deliver a spot forecast to them. Uh, towards the top of the hour, we issued our first spot forecast, and we had emailed and called them um, by 11.30 to ensure that they received the forecast, and we offered to do any plume modeling. They decided, uh, they declined, but the office we began generating high split runs anyway, and I'll show an image of, of what this looks like. So this is what we were seeing um, at 11 o'clock. So we knew that there was an explosion and you know, we could see some images from the local media of what was going on, but they were telling us that the fire was out. There was no real concern um, that there was a fire, there was an explosion, but everything would kind of been put out. There's no, no hazard at the moment. Um, and for those of you unaware of refinery operations, that uh, gas flare in the foreground, that's a normal gas flare. That's part of the refinery's operations. Um, but we could see this white smoke. What was happening, and we didn't know this in real time, but we found this afterwards, was um, from the explosion, a large chunk of metal had punctured a liquid asphalt tank. Um, and I don't have the number uh, on me, but liquid asphalt is kept at a very, very high temperature. Um, and so I guess what we were seeing was the white steam coming out of that. Um, there's a great technical explanation from the US Chemical Safety Board that goes into why the explosion happened, how the fire happened and all that. But what we have here is liquid asphalt coming out of a tank. Um, and so this is, this is what was going on. And these aerial images are courtesy uh, Bob King, who is a photographer for the News, Duluth News Tribune, our local paper. So by late morning, post explosion, we had um, the, Forecaster, uh, the lead forecaster was kind of handling all of the DSS requests from our partners. 
Um, I was kind of helping out with monitoring information as the forecaster. Our public service desk person, our Opal, was answering the phones. Our uh, Sue, who had been, uh, our Sue stepped out into operations and they were kind of acting as an instant commander, just kind of watching it, um, trying to see what's going on. And at this time, we really didn't need any extra help. So our intern was still basically on their X shift working on training and research and that sort of thing. So we're kind of at an ops level three. We're monitoring, we're watching things, we delivered a forecast. Um, but it kind of seemed like that was probably going to be the end of it. Just kind of heightened sense of awareness for, for weather conditions in case they needed any weather support. Uh, Route 1215, though, the situation changed dramatically um, and a large black plume of smoke appeared. Um, what had happened was the liquid asphalt had ignited um, and we were being told through the media and afterwards from the chemical safety board that liquid asphalt is very similar to like a tire fire in that it can burn for days and days and days. Um, and so there was the concern that, you know, that there might be this plume of black smoke going on for a while. Um, this obviously is going to be a concern for uh, public health in terms of you don't want to be downstream of this plume. Um, so by 1223, uh, we were starting to see the smoke on a radar. And so we switched our radar into 212 and a sales cut so we could get more uh, faster radar scans just to kind of track where the plume was. Between noon and 1245, we were kind of doing this iterative duty assignment to figure out who should be working on what. And I'll talk about this in a second. Um, and by 1256, we sent a high split run to the emergency manager. They did not ask for it, but we figured they would probably want to know where that plume was projected to go over the next few hours. And so we sent them that run. Um, again, from the beginning, we had a cold front come through in the morning. It was kind of northwest winds, um, which was kind of blowing it inland. Thankfully, not over any population centers um, right away. Um, at that time, at 1256, there was also an initial evacuation ordered by the county. Um, and we at this we at this time we also requested a goes mesoscale sector um, since we were beginning to see kind of some signs on the satellite imagery of the smoke. So this is kind of where we were uh, in the early afternoon hours, right around the one o'clock time frame. As phone calls came in, our public service desk handled those calls and was assigning essentially anyone that was a core partner from the state, county, federal level over to our DSS forecaster, the lead forecaster. Um, and then we had myself kind of acting in a public information officer role monitoring all the media stuff. And then when we had media calls, I was handling those as well. Uh, the student was kind of acting as the incident commander overseeing things. And then we had brought in our MIC um, and then utilized our intern forecaster to handle the rest of the routine forecast duties uh, that still had to be done. So at this time, we're almost using everybody in the office. There's a reason the WCM was not helping out. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but we we're basically at a level one ops level. We're using almost everyone that we can to handle this situation. At 120, there was a uh, civil emergency message issued for the initial evacuation. Um, and we posted a social media post with the radar depicting the smoke and the initial evacuation message. At 1.30, a ham operator arrived at our office. Um, this was part of Douglas County's EOC uh, activation in that they would send someone to our office and then also have ham radio people at their EOC to communicate any weather information. Um, at this time, there's also a second civil emergency message issued. Um, not to go too deep into this, but there was a lot of confusion with the graphic that we published. And part of the reason for this is that the county didn't have any official message or any official graphic for where the evacuation was. And so this was a challenge for us in that we're supposed to get this message out, but it was very confusing uh, in order for the public to understand. So this is the graphic the county eventually released, and you can kind of get an idea from the road, the grid map of the um, roads <clears throat> that the population center is kind of to the north, to the northeast, and then to the southwest of where uh, this refinery uh, was. And so it can be very confusing to see these three range ring circles and understand exactly where the evacuation was supposed to be. What we were told by the county was three miles east and west and two miles to the north and 10 miles to the south. And we weren't giving any road directions or anything like that. And so this is what we were publishing verbatim as is practice with a civil emergency message. You publish exactly what they tell you. Um, and so we had a lot of confusion about this because we didn't have a graphic. We didn't have a GIS ready file from the county with what exactly this area was. We published a map of the radar 
because we were we could see the smoke plume on the radar. Um, and so we kind of published a graphic showing where that smoke plume was. There's confusion though that, well, is that where we are evac is being evacuated? Um, and those areas did overlay, but this is from the after action report saying the evacuation zone was deemed confusing by many agencies, including us. Um, in the after action report, it gives a road of where north of there did not need to be an evacuation. Um, and it also has a different evacuation radius of one mile around the refinery from the initial messaging we received from the county. So there's a lot of confusion. When we published these graphics, um, you know, technically, yes, this is the radar overlaid with the actual evacuation area. Yeah, there was some overlap, um, but I think maybe afterward, it, it, if we had to go through this again, maybe we wouldn't have published any imagery just to avoid any confusion. So that was certainly a lesson learned from us from that event. Um, about two o'clock, we asked Douglas County if they would like to someone on site. They said yes, and our WCM prepared to deploy. Um, once we saw that smoke, we figured this was going to be a higher end event, and we figured they were going to need to have somebody on site. That's why our WCM wasn't helping out directly in ops. Um, at two thirty, we asked the WCM had departed. Um, we also asked Minneapolis to provide prepare to provide us with any service backup just in case. Part of this was um, just we only had so many people available to support the event. But also at this time, we begin to learn about, um, the, we get knowledge of a hydrofluoric acid tank, HF, that is kept on site at the refinery. Um, we had very limited information about this in real time, other than yes, HF is stored on site. Um, but if we had to evacuate our office, um, or if our people were impacted by this, we wanted to ensure that Minneapolis was prepared to back us up just in case. By three o'clock, the WCM had arrived on site at the EOC. So we've got a lot of people. So we've got a ham radio person in the office, um, public service desk, PIO, a DSS forecaster, two forecasters, uh, the MIC and an intern handling the routine duties. And then we have our Sioux acting as the incident commander. We also have the WCM who's deployed on site at the EOC. So again, pretty much level op, level one ops. And this is what it looks like um, in our operations area. We've sit, since redone our situational awareness walls and everything's on the front, but. Um, on the left there was a ham radio desk volunteer. Um, we've got Steve working the public service desk on the front left. In the back there is Linda working our forecast um, as it basically is the DSS forecaster handling off the core partner uh, needs. Um, myself on the front kind of acting in the PIO role. Um, our Sue who took the picture uh, was at that standing desk acting in the coordinator role. And then we have our MIC who you can't see in the back. Um, and our, one of our intern forecasters, as well as the evening shift forecaster arriving a little early. Um, the evening shift forecaster thought we might need a little extra help. So, uh, by 3.50, we decided to hold a quick conference call with our TV Mets. Um, so you can see on the TV, we had our local news. Our local news was wall-to-wall -wall coverage throughout this event. And this was very unusual. Our news station, we're a very small market. Um, and so it was very rare for our news to be going wall-to-wall -wall for something. While there were occasional press conferences, and is as in any breaking news situation, the TV uh, journalists have to fill the airtime if they're going wall to wall. Part of that airtime gets filled by the meteorologists. And so the weather people on TV were talking about, where's the smoke plume gonna go? Where's it gonna go tonight? Is there gonna be a risk for Duluth? And so we wanted to ensure that we were kind of all on the same page. And so we made the decision to hold a very quick conference call webinar with those uh, TV Mets. So we sent out an email to the TV Mets, um, and then we tried to follow up with phone calls to each of the TV Mets directly. Um, again, they were on air, so not all could actually talk, but they could at least listen and watch the webinar um, real quick to basically show them the high split runs. We didn't want to give them the imagery to show on air, but we wanted to show it to them at least to use to say, hey, here's where we're thinking it's going to go. Um, at 5.15, the Duluth Fire Department requested that we have someone on site at the Duluth EOC and the lead forecaster, uh, Linda, who had been providing support for um, the previous event from the beginning, she'd appeared prepared to depart now that our evening shift had arrived. So at this point, we've got a lot of people working. Uh, we've got two of our evening shift forecasters in. We also had another forecaster that came in to help, uh, to help out. Um, our public service desk is still working, um, as well as um, myself acting as a PIO, and the Sioux is in the office as well, still acting as the incident commander, coordinating everything. 
we still have that ham radio desk volunteer um, in, and we still have someone, we now have someone on site that did a Luth EOC, a lead forecaster, in addition to the WCM who's on site at the Douglas County EOC. So very busy. At this time, we're really thinking about, you know, we're getting into the evening hours and how long is this gonna go? We're hearing on the TV that, you know, this could go on for days. And so how do we provide support as we go into the overnight hours? Um, there was a concern of how the smoke might adjust as we go into the evening. We had high pressure building in. Could that smoke wouldn't go over Duluth? Would Duluth need to have a shelter in place order or an evacuation order? Um, and so we're thinking, well, who do we have available? Who's going to provide the overnight support? Do we start doing shifts at the EOCs? Um, and how many people do we have to pull from? At 635, there becomes a drastic reduction in the smoke. Um, and so this is the before image, um, and this is the after image from one of our TV stations, uh, the ABC affiliate, WDIO. Um, you can see the fire basically went away. Um, at 645, they held a press conference to announce that, yes, indeed, the fire had been put out. Um, the fire department did an excellent job, an amazing approach to basically contain the fire and then drown it out um, in, a, in a method that's, that the U.S. Chemical Safety Board has an excellent video describing their technique. Um, but they were able to put the fire out. Between seven and eight o'clock, uh, we began spinning down our operations conservatively, getting uh, staff out of the office um, in a slow way. We had heard before that the fire was out, and so we didn't want to risk that it could reignite and be caught with uh, too few people in the office. This is a timeline um, showing who was working and when they were working, um, and it kind of color coded it based on our, you know, assigned after the fact uh, ops level. So in that red is kind of when uh, we were kind of at our hot, highest level of ops and we had between eight and nine people helping out both in the office and outside the office. Um, and so, you know, it was a pretty high end event for us. I won't go into the meteorology challenges. Um, I am more of a services person, um, but we had a challenging wind forecast going into the overnight hours. And that was kind of the big question from, especially on the Duluth side, where is that smoke plume going to go when we go into the evening hours? We were concerned that the winds were going to shift to the northeast, which they eventually did, um, and that could bring the smoke plume over to Luth. If the fire had not been put out when it was put out and it went into the night, um, there was a real concern that the smoke plume was going to blow right over to Luth and possibly parts of Duluth, including our office, could need to be evacuated. Uh, there were also some challenges with the high split model. One thing that we did find out is that it does take a pretty long time to run. It can take 10 to 20 plus minutes. Um, that doesn't seem like a lot, but when you are running it and then you figure out that you want to change a setting in it, you want to make the dispersion run for longer, um, or you want to change the weather model that's used, it can take, uh, it can seem like an excruciating amount of time. We found the NAM nest did the best job, um, the wrap output, and so we're just doing a generic mass when we were running um, the high split. We found the wrap didn't match our expectations. It was bringing the plume basically due east, which did not match up to reality. Um, so we tried to find the model that best matched up to reality and then use that um, going forward for our forecast of where it would go. Um, and we also had a lot of uncertainty with regard to hydrofluoric acid. I did not know what HF was before this, um, and I still am not an expert on it, but we didn't know if we should try to incorporate this into the high split run. If it's released, how will it be released? There were a number of safety measures being there were a number of um, backup safety systems for the hydrofluoric if it were to be released. And so we didn't know how to model it correctly. We didn't know the volume. Eventually from the WCM on site at the EOC, we were able to get the volume information, but we still didn't know um, how it would be released. Would it be released as a gas? Would it just be a small puncture? Um, would it be a release all at once? And how does that get impacted? So a couple of lessons learned, things that went really well. Uh, I think we did a really good job anticipating our partners' needs, getting the spot and high split runs done before they needed them, before they even asked for them. Uh, you know, our partners are really busy and they appreciate when we can be on top of this sort of thing. So we saw it happening and we gave frequent updates. Um, this is from the after action review from the county. Um, and they, you know, talk about how we were a very large asset. Um, they also talked about how we helped with disseminating the mass notifications um, for the evacuation orders. Uh, we did a really good job, um, and this is mainly thanks to our Sue. We did a great job of documenting what had been going on. Um, so early on in the event, the Sioux basically kept notes of what was going on. So we, did, we weren't putting everything in, the, in our shift log as it was happening because it was happening all so fast. And 
it was just easier to keep a doc going. Um, we used a Word doc in real time, but nowadays we would have just used a Google doc and shared it with everyone. But basically we wanted to ensure that we were documenting. Who were we talking to? When did we talk to them? Who, like, who was that person? Why did they talk to them? What, what information did we give them? Do we need to call them back? How do we call them back? Um, and so it was really good for us to document that. We had calls from our partners on both the Minnesota and Wisconsin side. We talked to other people. We talked to the um, state air quality uh, people. We talked to um, random public people. We talked to someone that caught our office and told us exactly what we need to be doing. Um, and there's there someone from DC and they were trying to tell us what to do, just a private citizen that's concerned about all these uh, refinery fires. So there was a lot of communication coming in and out of the office. And so having constant documentation of what's going on was really useful in real time and also after the fact so that I could produce this presentation for you. Getting the evacuation message out went well. While there was confusion with the area, we certainly got the message out that there was an evacuation and that people could tune to other sources for information. We're directing them to the county for more information. So it went really well. Um, we ended up having um, 159,000 people reached, uh, unique people reached on Facebook and then the Twitter estimate of 169, 169,000. Keep in mind, our metro is just around a quarter million, and the metro is a very generous um, number. So we reached a lot of people. What could have been improved? Um, we could have improved our uh, hazmat training and some quick reference information. There was some quick reference information that was available, um, but not obviously available on our internet. So making that reference information available so that everyone knew how to run the high split correctly the first time. Um, having a deployment checklist would have been useful just to make sure that we had everything ready to go. Um, sometimes deployments are known about ahead of time, but sometimes they just pop up um, like this did. And so it's good to have a checklist to ensure that you don't forget anything when you're leaving the office. Communicating with the deployed meteorologist, we were initially just using Gchat. And so the WCM was just chatting me or chatting the Sioux directly um, on Google Chat. That doesn't work. Um, that didn't work very well in order to, it, in to keep the communication clear between everybody. So in the future, I think what we would use and what we've already set up now is a, a kind of an internal chat room on NWS chat. NWS chat though is not reliable at this point. So I would also recommend um, using Google chat now that we have the Google, the chat.google.com rooms um, or using a Google doc, um, something that is persistent, something that keeps all the messages. Um, so either that chat.google.com Dot com rooms or a Google Doc would be ideal for communicating with the uh, deployed meteorologists. There's also um, the NOAA Scientific Support Coordinator, who is a coordinator that's a go-between between the Coast Guard and the uh, and between NOAA. Um, we didn't know about this NOAA person um, until after the until after the incident or during the incident. Essentially, they called us and they said, "Hey, just want to let you know I'm here. If you guys need anything, and here's what I told the Coast Guard." We didn't really know this position even existed. Um, and so we had a call with him afterwards and he actually came out to our Great Lakes, to the Great Lakes Meteorolo Operational Meteorology Conference um, last year, two years ago. Um, and so that was really nice to have to improve that relationship so that we know kind of what our role is in these uh, kinds of marine related or marine adjacent accidents. I have a lot more information. Um, if you want to learn more, I have a full lessons learned doc, it includes a link to our actual timeline of this and more information. Um, and I can figure out with Jeff or Randy afterwards um, how to get this. I can post it on the SSD site with the recording. Um, but that's all I have.